Well, good day everyone, everywhere, and special greetings to all those seated in heavenly places in Yahshua, Jesus, our Messiah. Uh, today is our, uh, well, Studio Cam is on day, Prophecy Reality, and that's what we call it. I take a day every week to just uh, turn on the Studio Cam and talk about current events, things in the news, uh, different topics. Uh, whatever anyone wants to uh, add into the chat room and if you'd like to join us in the chat room uh, go to firstamendmentradio.com and uh, let me see how that works here it's the page firstamendmentradio.com and it says chat room at the top so all you gotta do is click on that and it'll take you directly to the chat room and you can join us live on uh, Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Pacific time noon Eastern time and uh, you'll be there. You can also watch the feed live uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, you can see my face and whatever exhibits I put on the screen at Prophecy Reality as Reality TV dot N E T dot net. And that's in the chat room. Prophecy Reality TV dot net for anyone who wants to see the video feed from the studio cam live at the undisclosed location of uh, the First Amendment Radio Studios. A uh, few people in the chat room have actually been here. <laughs> yeah, half of the people in the chat room have actually been to the studio. <laughs> okay, yeah, why is that funny? Uh, let's see, what do we have today? Well, we, we ended up last week um, with smoke and um, they got, got accused of cherry picking hmm. but anyone who uh, listens to my broadcast you know like five days a week <laughs> knows that there is no cherry picking going on whatsoever I mean how do you cherry pick when you go through the entire scripture book by book chapter by chapter and verse by verse now I'll leave the cherry picking to the uh, prophecy pundits and all of the fiction profiteers out there in the world that are making, uh, some of them making millions of dollars uh, on their books and movies and uh, things like that. What do we got going on here today? Oh yes, we're, good. we're talking about it. I cherry picked a verse. Now if you go to First uh, Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, about ver verse 13, you'll find that uh, Paul kind of takes a divergence from what he's talking about. Let's see, turn my mic up there a little bit, I think. And from what he's talking about in Thessalonians there. My producer's on the job. Yeah, that's me. I'm, I am my producer. Still looking for a, you know, a young-minded person, well, young man, when you're, when you're old like I am. <laughs> Most people are younger than you are. So looking for a young man or uh, someone that is that likes to do things like or would like to learn things like uh, you know uh, internet media broadcasting video editing things like that and uh, someone who's who has a fire for uh, you know the gospel and for prophecy and is willing to do things like produce my broadcast learn all about how. Uh, audio and you know audio streaming and all of that works um, and uh, video editing things like that who knows what could happen if uh, if God sends the right person here um, anyway let's let's jump into it uh, first Thessalonians 413 as I was saying Paul takes a divergence from what he's talking about and he says but I would not have you ignorant brethren Okay, so there it is. God does not want us to be ignorant. And Paul, in writing, says he doesn't want us to be ignorant. Oh, I know what's going on here. It always bothers me when those headphones are on. I can hear them buzzing in my background. See, that's the job for my producer, to take care of all the things that bother me during the broadcast. So I could concentrate on what I'm doing, okay? Anyway, I'll even flash it on the screen here for you cause, so you can look at the text as I read it. That way nobody will be able to accuse me of taking anything out of context. Let's see, which button do I push? That one there. 
Thank you, producer. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And of course, he means those that are dead, you know, the, the ones uh, whose mortality has come to an end. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. See, we have a hope. And uh, our hope is in the resurrection. Yeah, that's, that's our hope. That's all of it. You know, that especially when we're talking about them which are asleep or their mortality has uh, ceased. Uh, they've gone to the grave or however you want to say it. You know, we have hope. We'll see them again and we have the same hope for us that uh, when we go to the grave, when our mortality ends, we have hope and the hope is the resurrection. It is the covenant. It is an everlasting covenant. Because without the resurrection, there is no everlasting covenant. Unless you have some kind of idea about, you know, living on in the memory of your children or something like that. Forget that. I know how good my memory is <laughs> and how fast fading it is for people that I do directly. Uh, if, if all I get is to live on in their memory, yeah, I'm without hope. Okay, and that's what the world, you know, they live on in their memories. Yeah, good, good for you. Uh, I need a better hope than that. I need a lot more. And uh, the resurrection fits the bill for me. Okay? So Paul, uh, Paul continues here. He says, uh, I don't want you to sorrow, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. So when Jesus returns, okay, see, and this is God is doing this, but for if Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So when Jesus returns, God is going to bring those who have passed on or asleep or dead, the dead in Christ, uh, he's going to bring them with Jesus when Jesus returns, okay? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And it, maybe that's kind of an archaic old King James English says. He's saying that uh, we're not going to come before them. You know. Uh, and, and he goes out to spell that out. He says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, Okay, oh yes. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Oh, I guess that's not on the screen, is it? I'm going to have to get it up there on the screen. There we go. Okay. For we, uh, I would not have you... Okay, yes. Uh, messing it up here. Okay, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Okay. So this is one event. There aren't several phases to the resurrection. And I do not believe in the raptures. I know a lot of people think that the word rapture and resurrection are synonymous. Okay. The word rapture and resurrection for a lot of people is synonymous, and I understand that. You know, I am not, I'm not ignorant of that thing, okay? But to me, I would like to separate the words because I don't believe in the raptures. There's only one, well, there's only one resurrection that I'm looking forward to. There are several resurrections, and we're going to get to that today too because that's part of what we left off talking about last week. So that's why I wanted to expound upon it this week. So anyway, this is one a single event. Then we which are alive and remain, and you know Paul was writing that like it could happen to him at that time. But obviously it didn't happen almost 2,000 years ago and it hasn't happened yet. Now According to my calculations, if you do, if you look at my "What Year Is It" uh, uh, video, or you get my book and you look at the "What Year Is It" section, you find out we have about 40 years uh, left in this the sixth millennium from 
uh, the creation of the world, the sixth millennium. And the timeline is in the Bible. Like I said, get my book, and it's in there. You know, the, the most recent version, I still haven't updated my, uh, I found a six-year error. And uh, it was very tricky, but we'll go over that some other time. Um, so this is a one event in, that happens when the sixth millennium ends. Like I said, in about 40 years. So there's a possibility that I may see that event. Okay? Um, given my age today, well, there's a possibility I may not see it. Uh, there's a possibility I may be martyred in the interim. Um, you know, we've discussed before where uh, after the flood that, uh, that God said, uh, my spirit will not always strive with man, yet his years shall be 120. So he put a limit on the years of man. Now, it took a while for that limit to kick in because, you know, immediately after the flood, some people did live hundreds of years, okay? But it gradually declined from that point on to where we find even today, you know, some uh, 4,000 years later, we find that uh, that's about the limit that people live, or about 120 years. So it's possible that I could be living and, you know, be about 100 years old in 40 years. Um, but, uh, and Christ will return. So if I'm alive and I remain at that time, as many of you, the younger people that may be listening to this broadcast uh, are living at that time, and if they're in Christ, it says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and that is Jesus, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And that's so they can, because see, we're already up. <laughs> Those who are alive and remain. So the dead have to rise first to catch up to where we're at. And then, he says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. So we go up together with the dead in Christ. Because the word together, and I'll put that back on the screen there, the word together is definitely there. So you got, you got to pay attention to these, these, uh, these te time tenses. You know, we have past, we have present, we have future, and together means that the time tense is the same when this event happens. For the dead in Christ, they're going to rise first, and then that we shall be caught up together with them. And, uh, and also it says uh, in another place that we will be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And I believe that the dead in Christ and the people who are alive and remain are changed together. You know, I don't know how that works. You know, uh, there's been, uh, I've heard in the news uh, recently about... Um, uh, the, the controversy about uh, being um, cremated, you know, that and in, in past they believed if you were cremated that God wouldn't be able to put you together, back together. Well, uh, I hope that's not true, you know, because what if you died in a fire and you were cremated naturally, you know, or you fell into a volcano or something like that or into hot lava and you were cremated instantly, you know, or you... Yeah, what, whatever, you know, take your pick of uh, cremations. No, God is able. And, you know, what if one person has the same physical material that if someone, I mean, you know, there's a possibility, you know, someone died a thousand years ago and their their body rotted and turned and got tilled up in the ground and they grew up in some food and, you know, ten, you know, a thousand people ate from that field, I mean, you know, God is able. He's, he'll, he'll, the dead in Christ will rise. You know, nothing is beyond him. If he has to duplicate matter, if that's what it takes, well, he can do it because, you know, he made the world out of nothing. Uh, certainly, a little uh, task like raising the dead uh, from whatever state they're in, <laughs> you know, whether it's thousands of years, hundreds of years, or just minutes, uh, he is able to do it. So we don't have to worry about the details. God can do it. And so it's kind of silly to debate about cremation, whether God can raise you from the dead or not. Okay? Uh, creation, you know, cremation traditionally isn't, uh, isn't the thing to do. I mean, personally for me, uh, they can put my body in a body bag in the ground or a casket next to my 
uh, dearly departed wife when I die, and that will be fine with me. It doesn't matter. Uh, however, you know, if I get caught up and I get martyred and burned and incinerated, I think God can handle it. Okay, so we put aside that little debate there. So, but whatever it takes for in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, uh, being changed from either dead matter or or a living mortal into a living immortal, um, that's God's problem, and I think it's not really a problem for him. It's sometimes it's a problem for us to wrap our mind around those things. So we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And it says, what does he say? I would not have you ignorant brethren. It says, for we believe if Jesus died and rose again, even so that them which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him and he'll bring us who are alive and remain together, okay? Um, and to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with, the, with these words. So this is the resurrection. This is what happens when Jesus returns. The dead in Christ are raised. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of debates about, oh, we go to the marriage site. I mean, because a lot of people try to figure out, you know, when, when they added their, ra their, their raptures in, you know, where was the church going to be? Where, where were the dead in Christ uh, going to be for that seven years or that three and a half years? And, and a lot of people speculate, oh, well, that's when they'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb. No, nah, I don't think so. Because there's no pre-tribulation rapture. There is no seven-year uh, Dan Daniel 70th week that precedes the resurrection of the dead. Those, those events are never tied together in the scripture. Uh, that's not how it works. And if you don't understand that, you know, read my website or, or get the book and read the book. Uh, the name of the book is, the, is Footsteps of Mystery Babylon. And you can go to my website, crosstheborder.org, and just press on the, you know, click on the book cover and you'll figure out how to get the book in whatever form you want. A PDF, uh, EPUB, or you can get a print publication of that. And I suggest you do get it. Um, so anyway, this is the event that's going to happen in about 40 years. And now what happens after that event? That's, that's where we left off last week. What is going to happen after that event? Uh, that that is an interesting discussion. That is something that, well, I'm looking forward to it because I, I see the, the horizon. And I see it on the horizon. And many of you that are younger, you know, in your 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, you add 40 years to 40, well, a lot of people just don't live through their 70s. Uh, some don't live through their 50s even. So, um, but your but chance, the younger you are, you, the better your chances are of uh, being able to live that long. And uh, But see, I'm thinking, even if I could live that long, it's likely, you know, given the events of, uh, of Scripture, of the Revelation, and the number of people that will lose their lives uh, to martyrdom uh, during the Mark of the Beast Inquisitions, it's pretty likely that I will be martyred during the next 40 years when the uh, Mark of the Beast Inquisition comes full on. Uh, anybody who will be out there and has a public position uh, out there preaching the Word of God, making disciples, um, yeah, it's a good chance that, uh, that the Antichrist forces will be after you and uh, put you to death. Okay, see, WW in the chat room, what's he say? In the clouds, meet a cloud in the Greek is, <laughs> yeah, hmm, I don't, don't get it, I don't understand, Neph, Nephilim, <laughs> well Hebrew and Greek are not the same, so if it sounds the same in Greek as it does in Hebrew, that doesn't mean it's the same word, but yeah, that's a curiosity step away, and we'll have to look into the etymology of the word there, right, but in the clouds, you get it, you know, the clouds are up there. So somewhere when he's coming back, we're going to all be changed in, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I mean, just like that. And, um, and then we will return with him. He's bringing us back with him. And all of the dead in Christ will come back with him. And is that from Adam and Eve? T 
to the last person who dies before he returns? Well, it, apparently that's the way it works. That's what I believe. Now, I'm not an amillennialist. Uh, like, uh, well, perhaps it seems to me that um, smoke was a uh, was a. Uh, Touting a millennialist theology, saying it was all in spirit. Uh, let's see who else is an a millennialist. Um, Catholics are definitely all a millennialists, because and what is an a millennialist? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. An a millennialist um, either doesn't believe in the millennium, or they believe that Christ is not going to return and rule and reign physically on the earth, as uh, Smoke was saying last week. Is that spiritual? Well, it's spiritual now. So, I mean, if the millennium is supposed to be different than now and he doesn't return physically and we aren't all changed and, and resurrected, then what's the point? You know, to me, it's like, <laughs> you know, that, that takes away all the fun. That's everything I'm looking forward to, you know, <laughs> for the next thousand years. So an amillennialist is someone who doesn't believe in the physical return of Christ, but they believe, they might believe that the church is going to get victory and actually somehow rule the world, but you know, have you looked around lately? And, but you know, something like this may happen between now and the seventh millennium. And I believe uh, as an amillennialist, like I said last week, if you're an amillennialist, see then you need somebody like the Pope to take the place of Christ, because if Christ is going to rule and reign for a thousand years, and but he's not going to return, you know, to rule and reign physically with his feet on the earth, then he's going to need a government, and he's going to need a vicar. See, yes, that's see where I'm going with that. With uh, uh, it's a very Catholic doctrine. So who do we have that are amillennial? So I think like Rick Wiles. See, the way he's been questioning those things and, and almost ridiculing some of the beliefs that I hold, but trying to blame it on the pre-tribulation rapture people, and I'm not one of those. You all know that for sure. But anyway, we're going to jump into the millennium when I get back from this break. So uh, don't list... Don't, don't, don't go anywhere and if you have any questions about that or if you got something you want me to cover on that why don't you get in the chat room and uh, put the question in there and we'll see if we can uh, cover it all today this is prophecy reality don't go anywhere Listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. 
we're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Okay, well, welcome back. Uh, you're listening to Cross the Border. This is our Prophecy Reality Edition. And today we're talking about, well, the resurrection. And uh, we're, gonna br we're broaching the subject of the millennial reign of Christ. And we see that it, Paul talks about what happens uh, when the resurrection comes uh, and the seventh millennium begins. And so we would jump from uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.13 uh, through 18. Uh, we would jump from there to uh, uh, Revelation chapter 19. Uh, that's what I have. And I'll flash that on the screen here for you so you can look at that for all the people that are actually watching us on uh, prophecyrealitytv.net. Okay. Um, we see that something is going on here in uh, chapter 19. We see that <coughs> um, let's see the marriage supper of the Lamb is mentioned here in uh, chapter 19 verse t -t 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 where is that at? Uh, blessed are, oh yeah uh, verse 9 and he saith to me right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb and he saith to me uh, to me, these these are the true sayings of God. So we see the events that are wrapping up the sixth millennium in chapter 19. So if you read through that, um, you'll uh, let's see. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He tread the winepress of the fiercest of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the, of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, 
the flesh of the, that sit on them, the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on a horse and against his army. Now this is, this is what we call the, uh, the battle of Armageddon. Okay? This is the final battle of the, of, of the armies of the world against the coming Messiah. And it says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. So we've got it all here. We've got, the, we've got the beast. We've got the false prophet, who I believe is the Antichrist. I don't believe it's a different person. Okay? And uh, we have the image, you know, the image of the beast. The, the, the second beast made an image of the first beast. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And, and you notice uh, n- another thing while we're talking about the characters who are at the last half. We don't see the second beast here anywhere in this final end. So that might be a clue that America doesn't quite exist until the end or its prominence uh, is not, well it's not as prominent say as it is now and it has been in recent history uh, when things are wrapped up at the time that Jesus comes. Okay? And I had a dream about that, and I've shared that before, and perhaps I'll, you know, about America specifically, because, well, it's kind of the place where I live, you know, so uh, it's fitting that I should have a dream about what's going to happen in the next 40 years uh, in the interim before the events we're reading about now come to pass. But I notice the absence of the second beast, but I still see the first beast, I see the false prophet or the antichrist, and I see the image all present when Christ returns. And so I notice the absence of the second beast. So there's something to think about there. Uh, These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Okay, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And that's chapter 19. And that, that's the end. This is, now, if, when Christ comes and this battle proceeds, see, immediately preceding this battle is when the, the first Thessalonians uh, 4.13 event, 4.13 through 18 event takes place. The dead in Christ arise, those who are alive and will remain. No, we don't need seven years to get up to speed. You know, I, I've seen... You know, God, God is wonderful, and he's all-powerful, okay? Um, you know, and, and we understand what we are. We're humans. We need to get up to speed. I mean, look, we had to, we had to crawl before we could walk, you know? Um, we had to be fed w- before we could feed ourselves and things like that. But see, God can change things in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, to borrow a phrase from the scripture itself. And, and, and it's a marvel to me. See, God made us the way he made us for the purpose, uh, for, for his own purpose, and to develop a character in us. Okay? Um, because God could have made us to walk instantly, the, you know, a minute after we were born, like the horse. You've seen a horse born or a calf uh, or any of your four-legged critters out there that are born. They don't have to walk. They don't have to learn how to walk. They just get up and walk. And how about the little chick that comes out of the egg? See, it all comes pre-programmed. How does that chick, you know, it comes out of that egg, and within an hour it's up pecking at the ground eating food. Nobody feeds it. It just pecks at the ground and it eats, and it knows how to drink water and everything. You know? So, so God put that programming in them, And when God made man, well, he put programming in us different to make us dependent. Uh, And if you have a little little bit of wisdom to understand, you you think about these things and why God made us, you know, why didn't he make us like the chick that we could just pop up and start and walk over to the refrigerator (laughs) and start eating food by ourselves? Why why did he make us so dependent? Well, it's to develop us, uh, to develop our character so that we would have to be dependent. So... 
we would have to have the opportunity to love that little child and take care of it and nurture it and care for it and an opportunity to love and to give and you know all of those things so we understand that God can change us in the moment in the twinkling of an eye he can he can raise us from the dead uh, and those who are alive, he can change in a moment in the twinkling of eye and bring us all to back together with him, fully equipped, riding white horses, fully equipped to battle with him, with all the knowledge and experience that we need built in, just like that little chick that pops out of the egg. Somehow, it already has the experience in it to peck on the ground and feed itself. Okay. So... What, what seems like a, a, a hard feat for man or for us to understand the way things are now? Well, things will not be the way they are now. God is able. So we get to the end here of, um, of uh, chapter 19 of the Revelation. And uh, we see that we come back and the war is done and the remnant were slayed, uh, slain with the sword of him that sat in the horns and, the, and, and all the fowls will, will, were filled with their flesh. So, you know, God has his cleanup crew, and that is the fowls of the air. All right, so we go to our next chapter here, and that's chapter 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. I'm going to check the chat room before I move on. Um, yes, and say hello to everybody that showed up in the chat room here. Uh, yes, okay, well, everybody's with me in the chat room so far. <laughs> Put the Bible back up here on the screen. Let's see. So the angel came down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid, his, laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So, you know, we've been on this earth, you know, um, six millennium, 6,000 years at this point that we're talking about here. And all of that time, the devil has been on the loose, right, to go about and tempt people and be an organizing force for evil in the world. So, but he is going to be bound for a thousand years. No more influence of Satan. Now, for any mortals that are living on the earth, and, and I do believe that there will be mortals living on the earth during the millennial reign of Christ, they are still going to be the seed of Adam. They are still going to be dealing with the sin nature. They are still going to have a death sentence. You know, the you shall surely die death sentence that we are all born with. Okay? They will have that. Now, for those of us that are resurrected from the dead, well, no. Yeah, yeah, we don't, we, sin nature is gone, it's wiped out. We're cleansed of that. We're, we're, we're dressed in, you know, white robes, and we come back with the Lord. We've been changed, and we come back like Him. That's right, and we do that. Why? Because that's what we desire. I mean, that's what I desire. I mean, I never want to sin again in my life. Uh, I mean, how many of you could say, Amen to that? I look forward to the day when I will never even have the desire to sin again in my life. Uh, don't ever, I, I never even want to be tempted again, although I know that's a reality in my present condition, in this mortal present condition, uh, having the death sentence still upon me, because I shall surely die, even if I only die to be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye upon his return, or I'm martyred, or somehow I get hit by a Mack truck or something, and I'm going to surely die. Okay, the, the death sentence is upon uh, uh, the flesh of us all. Now, we have the earnest. We have the down payment. For me, I already have eternal life. I just know I have to get beyond this mortality to receive the, for this mortality to put on immortality. I haven't got to that point yet, but in my spirit, in my mind, you know, my eyes on the prize and I'll never depart. So I already have eternal life, spiritually speaking. The the flesh will catch up later. So for me during that thousand years, for all of the dead in Christ that are raised 
and resurrected and all of the, the few that are remain and are caught up with, together and changed in that moment in the twinkling of an eye, we will be immortals. We will be the kings and priests. And perhaps I'll just jump back into the scripture and let the scripture say it for us here. Because it says it explicitly. So, we see that he bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should <coughs> deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that he must be loosed a little season. A little season. Now the, the days of uh, the thousand year days of our creation which that we're speaking of the seventh or the Sabbath millennium now, I, I think they kind of parallel the seven days of creation in a way. Because uh, Satan was in the garden, apparently. You know, in the Garden of Eden. And uh, even though he was loosed a little season after the seventh, uh, seventh day, and I think it was, I think Adam and Eve actually fell on the eighth day. Uh, I don't think they, uh, they fell a hundred years later. But anyway, it's, it's just a thought I'm uh, rumbling around in my head here. Uh, parallel I've been working on. But it says, he shall be loosed a little season. So what is a little season? And it says, after the thousand, after that, he must be loosed a little season. Well, if a day is a year... Uh, and uh, a season would be, hmm, it's something to think about. Well, how do we interpret a season? Now, unless I get an interpretation from the scripture, uh, I'm only speculating. But it's called a little season, so it's not a long time. It may be just a matter of years. Uh, perhaps a season is like a quarter of a year, right? And if a year... If a day is a year and a season is a, uh, is a quarter of a year, then perhaps um, you have, uh, just speculating here, um, uh, uh, you know, 90, 90 days approximately, 90, 100 days, something like that. Would that be right? Or, and that, uh, to translate into the years, that may be 90 or 100 years if it's a day for a year. Just speculating there. Man. We'll have to look into that a little bit more. Perhaps I'll look to have to look into see what uh, E.B. E. Eliot uh, said in his Ore Apocalypse about the little season. Or uh, perhaps, uh, what's the other guy that, uh, H. Grattan Guineas, maybe he has something to say about that. Or Matthew Henry. But it's something to think about. I think about these things. <laughs> But anyway, so little season, you know, it may be a hundred years, it may be less, maybe a little more, but not much more than that if you're going for a day for a year and a season is a quarter of a year. Uh, see where I'm going at that. Okay, and I saw thrones and then that sat upon and judgment was given to them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God which had not worshipped the beast neither his image. So after the events of, uh, of the end of uh, chapter 19 uh, thrones are set and there, there's something going on here in heaven and it says and we're talking about those that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus that could be me you know uh, if it happens in the next 40 years although I would like to to live until then as long as I can be vibrant and and be preaching the word of God I'm happy uh, if, he, if he wants me to live until he returns, that would be great. As long as I can work for him, I don't have a problem with it. Um, and those which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received the mark upon their foreheads and their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now it says there, it doesn't say lived and reigned with Christ in the spirit for a thousand years. So everyone who wants the spirit, all the amillennialists who want to spiritualize this, well see, I'm I'm looking forward to what the Bible actually says. And it says that they lived, and that means they're not dead, okay? <laughs> because um, 
you know, if it's not a spiritual. It's a they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. I can't, I can't interpret that spiritually. I don't see any wiggle room to it. Interpret it spiritually. And it says now, it says, but the rest of the dead lived not again till the thousand years were finished. So that means if we live and reign with a thousand years that we're living. We're not dead. <laughs> this isn't something that's just happening in the spirit. Because it says, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about this is the first resurrection. Those that were raised with Christ and returned with him. And he says, judgment was, and was given to them. And these are talking about the people that died in Christ. And they live and reign with him for a thousand years because of the first resurrection. Remember, go back to Thessalonians event. That's the resurrection that we're talking about. That's the first resurrection. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. So if you die without Christ, see, it's the dead in Christ first, and then those who are alive and remain are changed and they're caught up together. Okay, that's the first resurrection. The second resurrection, it says the rest of the dead did not live again uh, until the thousand years were finished. Okay, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, um, if there is no resurrection and it's all just spiritual and Jesus isn't really going to come back and rule and reign for a thousand years but only in spirit, then how am I going to reign with him for a thousand years if I'm just going to go to the grave? It doesn't work for me. It, the, the, that's not what the scripture says. This is explicit. You can't get around this. The resurrection precedes a thousand years. That's the first resurrection. And we live and reign on the earth with him for a thousand years. And as now it says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed, about his prison, loosed out of his prison and go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. And you know, we get a clue here. Okay? There, there's a clue here. This is what Satan does. He is an organizing force for evil. Okay? He does the work of God of separating the wheat from the tares in a way, at least in the spiritual realm. And he's an organizing force for evil in the world. And that's why he has culminated in Mystery Babylon. And that's why it says that the fourth beast, uh, the, or the final beast of Revelation, the fourth empire, gets, his power, gets its power from the dragon, because the, the dragon is Satan. So he is an organizing force in the world for evil. And so he is loosed out of his prison to do what? To organize evil. And it says he goes out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So where does this Gog and Magog come from? Well, I believe... And I don't know who these people are that are going to be populating the earth as mortals during the millennium. But there will be mortals on the earth during the millennium. And you think about if there's no organizing force to bring these people together to separate them from God's people, then that would be the purpose of letting loose Satan. Also the Gog and Magog War, which the futurists want to lump together with the Battle of Armageddon, they want it all to happen in three and a half or seven years, and that's not going to happen. If you read Ezekiel, the Gog and Magog chapters of Ezekiel, uh, Revelation tells you when that Gog and Magog war will happen. It is after the thousand years, after the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years. Okay, so Jesus is going to be on the earth ruling and reigning with us, his, his kings and his priests, for a thousand years. Where we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. Now there will be mortals populating the earth. 
and we'll jump a little bit into that in our next segment here. Uh, who the mortals are, what it's going to be like, and what the government of Jesus is going to be like. And I think we have enough clues uh, right now to understand what his government's going to be like. Remember the lamb-like government that rose up in the wilderness but soon spake as a dragon because of the organizing force of Satan? The force is with you. <laughs> well, you know what? You, know, you, you have people that talk about... Uh, uh, we're about to wrap up this uh, segment here anyway, so I'll, I'll get Jen back on the screen here. But you know, they had this, um, what is it, Star Wars, the force is with you. You know, force is violence or the threat of violence. That's what force is. And that's what Satan is in the world. He's an organizing force for evil. He uses violence and coercion, tyranny, to organize people and to force the people into things force, <laughs> the word force, people into things that they don't want. Okay? In the kingdom of God, there will be no force. You'll see. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how that's going to happen for a thousand years with Christ reigning on the earth, what that's going to be like. Uh, maybe we'll get some insight. You're listening to Cross the Border. This is our Prophecy Reality Edition. Uh, visit my website, crosstheborder.org. Make sure you subscribe there and uh, share the posts there on your social network. We'll be back in about seven minutes. Do not go anywhere. <laughs> 